Well, good morning, CLC. We want to welcome you to our service this morning. For those who are watching online, we want to say welcome. We have a few new rules just to let you guys know of. And so we're going to, as you can see, we have a live band for the first time in months, which is very exciting. So these are some of the rules. While you're sitting in your seat, you're allowed to have your mask off, okay? When you're standing about to worship, we need you to have your mask on, okay? So you're allowed to sing, but your mask on. The, the new regulations say that we have to have a barrier. So as you can see for us up here, we have, you know, the, the plastic plexiglass here. And so for you, your barrier will be your mask. So please keep your mask on if you decide that you want to lift your voice and sing. And so if you don't, then you can keep your mask off. But if you open your mouth, then you got to put the mask on, all right? It's got mask on, mask off, mask on, mask off. And we also ask that if you're getting up to go to the bathroom, that you leave your mask on and you walk out and go to the bathroom as normal. It's so, kind of like a restaurant. How many of you have been to a restaurant now during these times? You're allowed to take off your mask at the table, but when you go to the bathroom or go anywhere, you have to have your masks on. So if you can please just follow those guidelines, we want to do our best to keep everyone safe. If you still want to keep your mask on throughout the whole service, you can. It's totally up to you. But why don't we stand, and then we're going to just take a second to pray, and then we'll get into our worship. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we can gather as one to lift your name. You are so good. You are so awesome. And we are here to declare that today. We are here to remember what you've done for us. And as we even partake in communion today, may we remember the sacrifice that you gave so that we can live and have life to the fullest. So we give you this time. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.
search me you know my way even when I fail you I know you love me your heart Sing that again. At the cross. And at the cross I found my knee. Where your blood was shed for me. There's no greater love than this. You have overcome the grave. You have overcome the grave. Your glory fills the highest place. And what can separate? Think about what you just sang, about the beauty and the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. 
at that cross, his blood was shed for me. At that cross, his blood was shed for you. At that cross, time and eternity stood still for a moment because the world changed when Jesus died. We all of a sudden had hope. Hope that what Jesus said he was going to do, he did do. And then when you couple it three days later, as of course also talks about with the empty tomb, we realize that what Jesus said he could and would do, he actually did. Friends, there is so much hope for us as Christians. There is so much for us to look forward to, so much for us to be thankful for. And we come to the communion table on the first Sunday of every month for a reason and for a purpose, to make sure that we do not forget that there is hope for us, that we have been extended love, that the God of the universe said, I am going to become like my creation so I can save them from their sins. We're going to talk more about that today. This is such a powerful moment for us to remember. If you've been walking through Christianity for a while and you've never caught a glimpse yet of the power of the cross, the power of memory for us, as we come to the communion table, I hope that today you will. If you're listening in online, we certainly encourage you to make sure that you grab some crackers and some, some juice or anything that will symbolize Jesus' broken body and his shed blood. What a privilege we have to remember the sacrifice that one man made on our behalf. Why don't you have a seat just for a moment? Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's the Apostle Paul speaking, and here's what he says. I'm passing on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, and he gave thanks to God for it. He broke it in pieces, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We all know, of course, that a, a picture is a powerful symbol. So Jesus took that bread, signified by the wafer that you have in the top of your packs, and he actually broke it. And he said, this is my body. It hadn't happened yet to him, of course. He hadn't yet gone to the cross. This was the Last Supper just before he went to the cross. And he was letting the disciples know <clears throat> that the next steps for me are not going to be easy, but I'm doing it because I love you. This is my body, which is given for what? For you. I'm going to be broken for you. <clears throat> and I'm doing it on purpose. I'm doing it with a reason in mind. Because I want to save you. I look at this, this broken wafer, and, and, and I mean, it can only very poorly symbolize for us, if you will, what actually happened. But at the same time, it is a reminder for us. This broken wafer represents Christ's broken body, which was broken for you and I. Let's partake together. Jesus, we don't pass this moment lightly. It is for us one of the privileges that we have in our Christian faith to remember what Jesus did. He said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. I'm grateful that Jesus went to the cross. It was, it was a Roman instrument of torture that was very specifically intentionally designed to maximize pain. Jesus knew what was coming. He understood the pain that he was going to experience. And he didn't run. He said earlier, greater love is no man than this. And he laid down his life for a friend. And I am grateful, God, that you call us friends. Verse 25 in 1 Corinthians 11 goes on to say, In the same way, he took a cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. It's an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Hebrews reminds us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Of course, in the Old Testament, we had the blood of bulls and goats temporarily appeasing the wrath of the Father. And now Jesus becomes, and we sang it, you are uh, the Lamb. Jesus comes for us as 
the spotless lamb, as the one who knew no sin, to take our place, not just temporarily, not just for a year or two or a month or, or a day, but forever, if we accept his sacrifice on our behalf. What an incredible story and message that we have. The God of the universe not only had his body broken for us, but his blood shed to usher in a new covenant or a new promise between God and his people. Not a covenant anymore of doing, but a covenant of being. A covenant of receiving by faith that which is being offered to us, and therein lies our righteousness. Not because of the good works that we have done, but because of the good work that Jesus has done. Can you say amen to that, friends? It is because of Jesus. And it's signified by his, by his broken body and his shed blood, by the broken cracker and the juice that you have in your hands. As we partake together of the juice, remember the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins and for mine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I want you for the next few moments, if you have a need in here this morning, if you're listening in online and you have a need, no matter what that need is, I'd like you just to simply raise a hand this morning. We're going to take some time to pray for you. Scripture reminds us by Christ's stripes, by the lashings that he received before he went to the cross, we are healed. And there is power, friends, in a prayer that is served up on behalf of others. Father, we just believe today, every hand raised if you have a need in here this morning. Father, I want you to come and see every need that is in this place this morning. You know what's going on in the marriages. You know what's going on in the finances. You know what's going on in the bodies. You know, Lord, what's going on in the minds. You know the anxiety and the heartache and the loneliness and the hurt that people experience on a daily basis. Father, you understand what finances need to be spoken to, what marriages need to be fixed and healed. Father, you know everything about us. And I'm praying for every hand that is upraised in this building and every hand that's upraised at home listening in. God, you know them specifically. This is what I love about serving a living God. You understand about everything that we're experiencing. And before we even raised our hand, you knew the answer to that situation in our lives. And God, I'm praying that your miracle working power would descend upon each story, upon each narrative, upon each heart today, right now, upon each situation, upon each bank account, upon each family situation, upon each job situation. God, you know exactly what needs to happen in each life. And we pray that you would show your power, make your name famous, prove, oh God, to your people today that you are a powerful God, able to reach into their lives and do, as the scripture says, exceedingly above all that we could ever ask or think. Father, increase our faith today. I'm reminded of the man that said to Jesus, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And Father, in each of us, help us in our unbelief because we, we, we want to believe, we do believe, but, but help us in those areas where we're just not quite sure. Father, strengthen and increase our faith today to believe that what God said he can and will do, he will do in our lives. Now, he may not do it in our timing, he may not do it in our way. God is not impotent. He's not asleep. He's not distanced himself from us. He cares intimately about each and every unique need. So God, speak into them, please, today. Where healing needs to come, provide healing. Father, in Jesus' name, you are a powerful, miracle-working God. And we know that. We know that because we accept it by faith, because we've seen it in Scripture, and some of us even know that because we've lived it out. We've seen you move in our lives in times past. And so, Father, increase our faith. As we live in these last days, we need more and more of you in our lives. And we are so grateful that you are at work on behalf of each person. Show your power, God. Father, we thank you for today and the privilege that we have of commemorating what Jesus has done on the cross. We thank you for today and those that are listening in and those that are here today and the, the privilege that we have of being able to raise our voices and worship to you. God, would you be pleased by our worship today? Lord, we recognize that our worship isn't just musically. Our worship is in how we treat one another and speak to people. Our worship is in how we give. Our worship is, is in our thoughts. It's in everything that we do. 
Lord, as we gather as the family of God, I just pray that you'd be honored. I pray that you would give us tremendous and continual favor in our community, both around us and certainly, again, those that are listening in online. Give us favor, God. Help us to make sure that the name of Jesus is loudly proclaimed in these last days. And not just proclaimed with our lips, but lived out with our lives. These are interesting times, Lord. I don't think there's one person in the world that would say this is normal. But we are grateful that at the end of the day, we serve a living God who knows the beginning from the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You're not shocked. You're not surprised. You know all that's going on, and you are working out your master plan. And so, Father, today in this congregation of people, would you draw us closer to you? Let not one of us be those that Paul talks about to Timothy in the last days that people will fall away, turn away from the face. Let not one of us be those people, but may we be rooted and grounded in the faith so strongly as we bring honor to your name. Father, we bless you, we love you, and we say thank you for all that you are doing. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hmm. Friends, we cannot afford to ever lose sight of the fact that God is real in our lives. It is so easy for us to just, you know, do our deal on Sunday and come to church and then, you know, forget about God the rest of the week. Don't forget, He wants to hear from you and commune with you every moment of the day. Some of you have lots of time on your hands because of COVID. Others of you are crazy busy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Set your alarm 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes earlier. Get to know the God who loves you enough that He goes to the cross to die for you. What a great God we serve. Praise God. Why don't you take this moment, we're not going to do the meet and greet thing, but why don't you just look around and maybe wave at somebody you haven't seen in a long time and say hi and, you know, can't get you up and around, but we can get you doing that, right? <laughs> I'm going to ask our, uh, our new pastor, we announced it a few uh, days ago, our new pastor, Pastor Tiana, who's our children's pastor, she's going to come, and uh, we want to take some time just to pray for our students and our teachers as they go back to uh, school this week, whether they're adult students going to school or children going to school, uh, we recognize this is a very, very tough time for some of you as parents and some of you that are even here today and listening and are also teachers. And uh, we're very grateful for you as teachers and for all that uh, you do. We've asked Tiana just to pray for uh, both our teachers and our students as they go back, that God will be with them and bless them. And uh, so if you're here today and you have, a, uh, you have some students with you uh, that are part of your family, uh, would you just reach over and as a mother or father or grandmother or whatever, just put a hand on them and just, uh, just to pray for them as, uh, as we pray for them as well. Okay? Lord bless you. Will you guys just join me in bowing our heads and closing our eyes with me? Lord God, thank you for our children, Lord God. Thank you that as we prepare to go back into September, as we prepare to go back into this new school year, Lord God, that you prepare them, Lord God. You prepare them that they know that they, you are with them through every step and journey that they may encounter, whether they are at home doing school, whether they're at school doing school. I pray that you are with them, Lord God, and I thank you that you lay your hand on them through every journey that they may go through, Lord God. I pray for the parents who are also going into this time of uncertainty, Lord God, who may not know what the school year holds for us, Lord God, but I thank you that you have a plan for each and every one of these lives, Lord God. I thank you for these children, Lord God. I pray that you continue to raise them and that they continue to grow not only in their studies but in their knowledge of knowing you, Lord God. I continue that your light shines through them, whether that they are in their living rooms or in their schoolyards, Lord God. I thank you for the plans that you have for their lives. And we thank you for all that you are in their lives and that they remember that you are always with them, Lord God. Lay your hands on the parents and lay your hands on the students, Lord God, as we continue into this new journey of uncertainty. We may not know what's next, but you do, Lord God. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for your rich blessings upon our life. In your name we pray. Amen. So before we go to announcements, we do have a, a birthday today. And so if you're a first time visitor, if you're watching online, what we do is when it's somebody's birthday on the Sunday, we tend to sing them happy birthday. So today it is Che Jr. Spencer over there, his 16th birthday. 
So this is what I'm going to ask us to do. If you guys can stand up, except for Che Jr. there, put, put on your masks, and we're going to sing happy birthday. Right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday. Hey CLC, it's Roxana, and here are these week's announcements. How amazing was our first ever drive-in outdoor service? We had beautiful weather and an amazing turnout, both in person and online. If you missed it, we have some good news for you. On Sunday, September 20th, we will be having another drive-in outdoor service. Just like last week, if you choose to sit with us, please use the Ravenscroft entrance, park in the upper parking lot, and walk down with your lawn chair. If you choose to stay in your car, please enter through the Roslyn entrance and follow the instructions of the parking attendants. We strongly encourage you to sit with us as parking spots are very limited. Either way, please register through our website at www.christianlifecenter.ca under event registration. We will also be having a water baptism during our outdoor service on Sunday, September 20th. If you made the decision to follow Jesus and are ready to make a public declaration of your faith, please email me at roxana at christianlifecenter.ca, as well as if you have any questions. You will be asked to attend a Zoom video water baptism class on Monday, September 14th at 7 p.m. with Pastor Sam. Some more good news. As you've already seen today, the government health and safety guidelines have recently been updated specifically in regards to church services. What does that mean for us? Well, first of all, we are beyond pleased to announce that as of today, we will be allowing indoor singing again. You'll see a smaller worship team than usual and they will have plexiglass barrier to protect both themselves and the congregation and all other social distancing protocols will be in place as they have been, so no worries there. Secondly, masks are still strongly encouraged, but no longer mandatory. But wait, before you get too excited or worried, there's a catch. As for the new guidelines, and in order for us to do our due diligence with following the new government protocols, here's what we're asking. When entering and exiting the building, mask on. Headed to the washroom or in the lobby, mask on. If you're choosing to sing during worship, mask on. If you want and or feel more comfortable wearing one the entire surface, yep, you guessed it, mask on. The only time you should have your mask off while in the building is during announcements, the sermon, or any other time you're seated among your family or social circle. So please don't forget to bring your mask with you. And it's still super important that you continue to register each and every Sunday through our website, www.christianlifecenter.ca under event registration to make check-in faster and easier. And so we have accurate information for contact tracing purposes. Finally, just a reminder that there will be no formal offering taken during our in-person service until further notice. However, Please feel free to drop your tithing envelopes in the Welcome Center desk slots or our mailbox at the front entrance. You can also text the word GIVE to 905-686-1411. You can visit our website at www.christianlifecenter.ca under donate. You can send an email money transfer to life at christianlifecenter.ca or mail in a check to 1030 Ravenscroft Road, Ajax, Ontario, L1T 4R9. You can find all of these details on our website under the Donate tab. Don't forget to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel or follow us on Instagram or Facebook by going to those websites and searching for at DiscoverCLC to find us easily and to stay connected. I'm Roxana, and those were this week's announcements. Enjoy the rest of service.
All right. How many of you have been on a cruise before? Some of you? Okay. If you've been on a cruise, all you got to do is close your eyes and listen. Doesn't that sound like the voice that's on a cruise? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just perfect voice. It's just, it's beautiful. Good job. Okay, so I think the whole, I just realized I've got mine on and I don't necessarily need it. I think that the whole, well, that's why you're not getting sound, Jeremy. Okay, I don't have my mic on. There we go. I think that the whole mass thing has become a little more clear to you. Thank you for your help in that way. Um, we perhaps didn't announce it as clearly as possible last week, so we made sure that we announced it a little more clearly today. You're welcome to uh, take your mask off during sermon and uh, during the announcements, but other than that, we appreciate if you would keep it on. Um, just gives you a little bit of, no pun intended, breathing room uh, in, uh, in your experience here on a Sunday. Okay, great to have it. All right, uh, we're going to show you actually a little video. It is, a, uh, it is an interview between myself and Joanne Rourke. As many of you know, Joanne just retired uh, and actually finished up her time with us the end of August of this year, so just uh, last week. Joanne was on staff with us for 31 years, and uh, rather than having her come in and doing a presentation and everything here, we both just decided that we wanted to do it a little bit different. And so I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to interview her, and I want you to hear a little bit of what she has to say about her time here and her experience. Uh, she was really a, a really faithful administrator for us and finance person over the years. Seen a lot of pastors come and a lot of pastors go, and uh, it was her time to retire. We're grateful that Leslie has come on as our new finance person, and she's doing a great job. Um, and we are going to, as a board, we'll work on uh, putting together some kind of a gift for Joanne as well. We have a board meeting in a week or so, so we'll, we'll figure that out. But this is kind of our way of saying goodbye to Joanne and, the, uh, and thanking her for the great job that she did. So I want you to watch this video. Okay, bless you. All right, so we're here today with uh, Joanne Rourke. Joanne has served our church for about 31 years uh, in various roles. And uh, we just want to do something a little bit different today. We wanted to just interview her and talk to her about her experience and her life here. Um, she has uh, really been a faithful servant over those years, and she is retiring at the end of August of 2020. And uh, so as a way really just to highlight her ministry here, we thought we'd take some time just to interview her and uh, talk to her about life and about ministry here at the church. So good to have you, Joanne. Thank, Thank you. you. We've worked together for about 10 years yep. of, your, uh, of your 21. How many pastors have you gone through? And that's kind of a funny way to say it, but how many pastors have you gone through over the past uh, 31 years? How many have I survived? Yeah, how, many, how many have you survived? Exactly. Uh, okay. Um, I have, uh, there's been 31 pastors wow. and there's been seven support staff, I guess you would say, that have uh, assisted me, been with me, yep. uh, done jobs with me. So I got I to gotta ask, who is the best? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Don't answer that. I'm not going to. Because <laughs> yeah, then I'll hurt somebody along the way. Probably exactly. all 31 of them. Right? Probably. Yeah. Well, at least 30 of them. Yeah, that's right. You have seen, obviously, a lot of changes over the years. What's the most significant change that you've, uh, you've noticed, whether ministry-wise or technology or the building? Wow, a lot, actually. Um, oh, well, I'll start with, uh, I guess, technology. Yep. Uh, when I first started, we uh, had typewriters only. Um, wow shouldn't say that we had one computer it was a Burroughs which I don't think anybody would know about it's not nope. a company that anyone knows exists um, we didn't have it very long um, but everything was done on typewriter the bulletin was done on a typewriter uh, we had to copy and paste pictures to make the bulletin work yeah remember those days uh, yeah um, we had um, like a Stetner photocopier yep. and stuff yep. um, we uh, then we you know, progressed to the photocopier where we could uh, put in, um, have paper and then we got a folding machine part of the photocopier, color part of the photocopier. Um, when our bulletins were, part of our bulletins used to be uh, like 25 it seemed, uh, inserts in colored sheets of paper to bring out the things which obviously we don't do and now we're yeah. at a monthly bulletin um, online those kinds of things. Lots um, of technology change over the years. Yeah, the finances, which I've done for the majority of my job, uh, was done on in paper, on you know ledgers, and yep. then uh, got our first program. Probably been through about four financial programs over the years, learnt and uh, yeah. changed. So that's another thing. Um, from the building, wow. Um, There's been a lot of renovations over the years. Lots of renovations. So talk to us about those. We've done the sanctuary. The nursery has been one. Okay. Um, the one that most people probably don't know about or know is that the offices back here, which are now three offices, uh, when I first started was one big room, right. one very large board room table um, with a bit of a library back where the fireplace is mm -hmm. um, in uh, Pastor Kareem's office right now. Um, it was one very big 
boardroom and then we divided divided into one office with some space and two and so forth um, wow. desks have been everywhere I've sat in the main office area I've sat two people in the main office areas <laughs> we've had a receptionist out in the lobby um, we've had uh, the gym the gym used yep. to be carpeted with wow. with a <laughs> uh, with a stage no um, kidding which obviously wasn't really a gym. I would say it was more of a yeah. fellowship hall. Yep. Um, the kitchen has obviously gone through a, a reno. Yep. Um, the CE, the CE wing itself, obviously too, has yep. gone through a reno. Um, yeah, that's that's you know. A lot of course, of, we did this the lobby, lobby here exactly. two years ago, where we're sitting right now. It used yeah. to be a, another room, actually one of the offices, I think. Wasn't two it? offices at one right. point. Right. Um, so yeah, this was another space of offices. Um, Another thing about the building that most people may not know or remember is that we used to have a school, Pickering Christian okay. School, yep. um, used to be here. It started in 1984. Financing. Yep. You've done administration. Yep. I've done finances. I've done administration. Well, mostly all the administration, yep. right? Reception work. Reception work. Okay. Um, um, you know, from a VDC became part is part of yep. what you know. You, I've done registration for Vacation Day Camp and been involved in part of that. Yeah. And that was a big deal, right? Uh, Over the years, that started deal. years yeah. ago. Yeah. Actually, VDC started in about nineteen, the late nineteen nineties. Okay. Um, so the VDC that we know now is a product of that uh, VDC that we started in 1990 or late 1990s. Um, the changes there, I mean, we one year we actually had a helicopter <laughs> uh, land wow. in our lower parking lot when we could, because yep. obviously I don't think we would be able to do that now. Yep. Um, we, uh, we used to have a, a slide, a um, man-made slide down the bank over here, mm -hmm. um, put tarp down, water some soap and let the kids come down and have all the men and uh, older boys line up side to side to catch them all yeah, no so injuries just the kids could go down the slide only the kids could go down and we've uh, had no injuries bad. yeah i know <laughs> but it was no injuries which i think is one of the bigger issues yeah. at the time which again yeah. we cannot do so nobody asked for that this any vacation day camp yeah. um we've seen you know so vacation day and then we obviously the introduction of the pop tarts mm -hmm. which is a very big thing happened in uh, you know the 2000s yep. um, and that's another big part of it the stage the sets have always been bigger and better and yeah. you know for VDC it's been a very big part of it um, missions has always been a big part of CLC Our as church. well yep. yeah missions, still is yeah exactly and missions week missions as you see for the you know with the mm -hmm. here but missions is a big big part we've had the missionaries here it's it's you know it's been something we've grown and keep wanting to make sure we you know yeah. highlight and I would actually suggest it's one of the reasons why this church is strong and healthy is because of that missions I component agree. you I know it's agree. been uh, it's been good for us to be involved in over yeah. the years yeah. supporting other yeah. people it is. so if you had to grab 31 years worth of ministry yeah. and uh, a couple of favorite moments favorite what would you say um, <laughs> oh, this is a really right, random favorite moment. Sure. You ready? Nothing ministry-wise. Can it be non-ministry-wise? Can it be kind of you a, can funny, be whatever you want. a funny um, <laughs> um, ministry moment? Um, when I first started, we had to be dressed up for work. Oh, yeah. Okay? okay? Like it was, you know, pantsuits or skirts and dresses and guys were in suits and so yeah. forth and so on. And, and uh, you know, we worked hard on 
with today on Dave Imler to get us to have at least have Casual <laughs> Friday, you know, and uh, that. Did you have to pay a quarter though. Well, that took it did. <laughs> it took a while to get us to Casual Fridays, and then one year we decided we really didn't want just Casual Fridays, but we wanted Jean Fridays. Like yeah. we didn't want to just be casual, but we wanted Jean. So. Um, all of the staff, office staff and pastor uh, staff, we brought in all of our jeans that we owned. Yep. And we literally strung and stuffed and did his whole office <laughs> in jeans. And I mean, jean jackets, jeans, jean shorts, jean skirts, <laughs> jean shirts, I mean, strung it up and wow. the whole thing. You couldn't get through to his desk without going through jeans. What we didn't, re and we did it on a Friday, which yep. was his day off, and we thought, you know, this would be great. What we didn't realize was that he was actually having a meeting. Oh boy that oh, well. day and he actually brought in a guest <laughs> into the office and opened it up and was like uh what's all these jeans doing yeah, here yeah. and so yeah so we got our jean uh friday but uh, yeah. it wasn't quite what we were expecting so that's it's a memory i can't forget because we just had so much fun doing it right. do you know what i mean yeah. um another ministry but a ministry highlight i guess i would have to say and this goes back a little bit to missions but um I would, I was involved with the youth, um, you know, year, for quite a few years ago, under Mark Barrett and Dan Collin, uh, later, but Mark Barrett mostly and Dan, um, and uh, would go to their youth retreats and some of their Wednesday nights youth and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the youth retreats I went to, I prayed with a girl, a person who had just started coming to youth and just, you know, felt God tell me to go and pray with her and I did and um, and it turned and that girl is Jen Lee Jacob, oh, wow. Jen, Jen Jacob. Yep. and uh, we formed a relationship and a friendship through that but and it, she's nowhere she's now in Romania as a missionary exactly and, and has she, been for 20 plus years 20 plus years and yep. she her and I kind of remember that as, really as an cool. interesting moment where you know I didn't know her yeah. I didn't she wasn't somebody who I would have just like, oh, I know to go to pray for yeah. people I know or whatever. And I didn't know what I was praying for or what and what she was struggling with at the time. But um, Very you know, neat. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat memory to kind of have and to know that, yeah. you know, when God lays it on your heart and you do and you follow it, uh, you know, it, it matters, you know. Well, and we're about that business, aren't we? We are a yes. church and yeah. we're in the business of transforming lives. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure over the years you could point to countless people, you yeah. know, over 31 years oh, yeah. and say, I saw them move from here to yeah. here. Yeah. And their life was changed irrevocably yeah. for the better. Yeah. Right? And no yeah. doubt there's been some um, changes that have happened the other way. Yeah. No doubt there's been some challenging times yeah. uh, here in the church. But you've weathered all of those. Yeah. And you've seen a lot of people um, change yeah. and be transformed and be touched by the power of God. And that is what we do. Yeah. Right? And myself yeah. included. I mean, exactly. you know, I, I've, I've said to so many people over my life and career here I guess is that I never looked at it as a job it was a calling just like it is for a pastor mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't think I would have stayed as long as I did um, through all the situations that have been here good bad and not even bad but just highs and lows maybe yep. Um, yep. if I hadn't felt that it was where God was placed me and told me to stay and when you know and my retiring now is God letting me know that I needed to time to for me I was done my time was done yep. and I you know I didn't stay because it was a paycheck I stayed because it was a it was a calling it mm. was where I felt God placed me um, sure I didn't think when I started in February 1989 that I'd be oh. sitting here August 2020 yep. um, talking about it you know um, it wasn't in the plans and um, yeah. It's got to be somewhat surreal. Yeah, it is. It's very surreal because... Yeah. Could you raise your family here as well? Yeah, I mean, Kyle was raised more here, I think, than at home. He'll tell you that yeah. he knows more about the building than anybody because, <laughs> I mean, he went to school here, right? So he went to the Pickering Christian School and yeah. it was perfect because he'd, I'd drop him off, I'd go to work, which is up the, up the stairs. Yeah. And then after school, he'd hang out, play, and then he'd come up and be here with me after and then we'd be able to go home. So, I mean, it was, it, there's been so many blessings that, you know, working here, being here has, has brought to my family, to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have, you know, it's, like I said, I've, if you had asked me in February 1989 when I started, it wasn't, it wasn't a 31 year yep. Yep. 
career or ministry. It was. And yet here you are. Here I am. Right? You've put 31 years in, and uh, you know I'm reminded of that verse where Jesus said, "Well done, my good and faithful servant." You thank know, you. and so. Uh, we want to take time just to honor you and say thank you for 31 years because that's you. a long time. It is. That's, uh, that's over half of your life. Yep. That you have put into yeah. um, I'm not to being here. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying how old. I can say that I'm not 62. <laughs> it's over half your life that you put into to serving here. Yep. And again, weathered some storms, uh, you know, rode the, the wave of the highs, yep. um, and been faithful through it all. And not many people can say that. A lot of times when things get rough, people take off. Yep. So, you know, thank you. Uh, from us. Um, you know, I've worked with you for 10 years. It's been a pleasure, joy. I appreciate all the hard work that you have put into it while I've been here. Um, and, you know, as you said, you've weathered, you know, 38 pastors yeah. uh, or 38 staff, I guess, total. Yeah. Um, and great just to see the consistency. There's something to be said for that, for that mm -hmm. consistency in, in taking, you know, the time to uh, be there and be yeah. faithful and to be loyal. Thank so you. we truly, uh, truly, truly appreciate that. Thank you. I do have one last question. It's been bugging me and I need to ask you this. Okay. I have really bad handwriting, but I just want to know, am I the worst handwriting pastor you've ever had? No. No, no, no. Yes. I would say no. Yes. And I'll throw somebody <laughs> under the bus on this one. Please do. Because I can, and he would agree with me. Uh, I'll say Mark McKnight had the, Mark worst, McKnight. Had the worst handwriting. So there you go, Mark. There you go. <laughs> That's you for beat Mark. me. That's for Mark on that one. I'll, I'll, I'll have to give him that one. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, so there yeah, you go. Very good. Now, I, I just thought of one other thing, yeah. too. You have had, and, and, and I'm not going to throw you under the bus, I you hope, can. but you've had a lot of hairstyles over the years, I too. Have. So. <laughs> There's I been... would say that that's be the biggest change that has happened <laughs> in my years of working at Christian Life Center. Exactly. I've probably had more than 31 hair wow. colors, hairstyles yeah. in those 31 years. I, I would, it. I would agree. You like and, to experiment, and, and I've never been one to stick with the same things. So yeah. There you go. So, I love it. So there you go. I would agree. I know. We'll end on a, with that. end on a high note. That's end good. A I'm good note. with that. I'm good with that. Again, thank you for all that you have done, and we're not going to get a chance to reason why we're doing this because yep. we're not getting a chance yep. to have you uh, as part of our uh, regular service right. because nothing is regular anymore right. uh, due to COVID. But uh, again, very grateful that you'd sit and take some time to talk with us today Thanks. and uh, to do this. So thank you okay. and uh, happy retirement. Yeah, Hope that uh, all goes well and that you and Barton just really, you know, take some time to enjoy life and uh, take some time to, you know, maybe do a little bit of travel, a little bit of exploring and just being together. That's well, uh, going to be looking, great for we're you. We're looking forward to it a lot. Yeah. Like I really... Um, it's not one of those things where I'm going into it with trepidation. I'm, I'm going into it with excitement and, and can't wait. So. Excellent. Thank you. Very grateful. Anyway, we want to let you know uh, who Joanne was. Some of you have had a chance to get to know her and see her, and some others haven't. But we want to take some time just to honor her and thank her for all that she has done. We hope you've enjoyed this. And uh, we look forward to uh, having Leslie really take over Joanne's job and be a part of the uh, finance. Um, but in the meantime, Joanne has been a very faithful servant, and we're very grateful that she's here. So that's it. God bless. Thanks for joining us today. Take care. All right, so we're here to... And certainly, if you uh, if you know Joanne as well, please uh, take some time just to wish her uh, all the best on her retirement. Um, grateful for uh, for all that she's done here over the years, for sure. It's good. Um, I have not yet taken the time to thank our tech team, uh, our audio and visual department, for all the work that they have been doing. Would you just help me by giving them a great hand? They have been doing a phenomenal job. If you are listening in online, you are seeing and hearing because of the great work that they are doing. So thank you to all of you. Uh, they have just been great, certainly under the guidance of Pastor Andrew as he's been working with them. So, so, so thankful. We've been able to switch gears fairly quickly uh, as, uh, as COVID hit and, um, and even running to the live stream. And it's certainly well beyond my pay grade what they are doing. So thank you, uh, gentlemen and ladies, for all that, uh, that you've been doing. We're starting a new series today. Uh, the new series is, uh, I'm going to title it Servant Leadership, really a, a study of Jesus through the eyes of Mark. Now, I know we've gone through Mark before, but I want to slow down and take a more in-depth look uh, at the book of Mark. I feel like in these days, in this day and age specifically, preaching about Jesus is never a bad thing. Do you agree? This makes sense, doesn't it? We need to understand 
who he is. Um, I think it's important that we, uh, we understand his life and, uh, and the things that he's done, and I'll, I'll reference that a little more in a second. But I hope that, uh, hope that you enjoy this series. I'd encourage you to read through the book of Mark at least once or twice during the uh, series um, and really capture for yourself what it means to be a servant leader. That's the, uh, the attitude that Jesus came across with uh, over the course of that book and certainly the other Gospels, and I think there's something incredible to be said for that, and uh, we're certainly going to explore it uh, a little more as time goes on. Obviously, our time is getting short uh, today, so I have shortened things up a little bit uh, for you, but I just want to just kind of to, to just really give you an introduction this morning uh, to the book of Mark. Uh, before we get too far, though, I want you to try to think for a moment about some great people that have lived on this earth uh, over the years. So just, just think about a few of those. You don't, don't pull me out any names, but just think about a few people that you think are great. Now imagine what it would have been like to have a front row seat into their life, into the way that they thought and into the things that they experienced and to walk with them as they did what they did. I mean, imagine being with Abraham Lincoln as he was leading the Union Army during the Civil War, as he signed the, the Emancipation Proclamation. Imagine being there with him and what that must have been like. Imagine being with Churchill as he was making decisions that would affect literally the course of history, certainly the, the course of the world at his time during World War II. must have been incredible to, to hear and to understand certainly what was going on uh, in his mind. Imagine being with Nelson Mandela as he was, was, uh, was really uh, uh, giving his opposition towards apartheid, and, and again, what must have gone through his mind. Imagine sitting with Leonardo da Vinci as he's painting the Mona Lisa, or perhaps with Michelangelo as he's carving the statue of David. I mean, all of these, what we would consider great people, and, and us being able to hear and see and understand what goes on uh, in them. And it got me to thinking, as I was thinking about that question, it got me to thinking, what really defines the greatest? What standard do we use to understand that something or someone uh, is the greatest? Is greatness really determined by what that person has done while they're here? Or is it determined by you know, what, they have, what they have left um, behind as they've left this earth? Is greatness determined by man's standard? Or is it determined by God's standard as Christians? And so, you know, I thought, well, I mean, let's go to the, the, the one who knows everything, right? Let's ask Google what, uh, what it means to be the greatest person. So I went on Google and I typed in, you know, uh, who is the greatest? And, uh, of course, it took me to Wikipedia, which never lies about anything and is always correct. And Wikipedia referenced a book by a guy named Michael Hurt. I don't know what the name of the book was, but he was basically uh, defining uh, for us, as the author of the book, who he felt were the greatest people to have ever uh, lived. And so this was his list, Michael Hurt's list. Uh, number one was Muhammad, was the greatest person to have lived. Isaac Newton was second, and Jesus Christ was third. It got me thinking beyond that, who really decides who's greatest? I mean, for some of you, your nan is the most incredible person in the world. So, I mean, greatness is really subjective, isn't it? You just, we don't always necessarily know, and on many levels, it can be subjective. I personally think that greatness is really defined by the ability to make an impact on someone else's life. And if this is the case, nobody can hold a candle to Jesus Christ. Friends, what we think about Jesus what we believe about Jesus really serves as a dividing line for us in our lives and for all of eternity. You're either on this side where you don't believe in Jesus and don't think about Jesus, or you're on this side where you do believe in him for your life. Can I say clearly, he is the key to everything in life. And so what you think about him is incredibly critical some of you may be here today or listening in online, and you may say, you know what, I don't have a relationship with God. I'm just checking things out. That's great. But let me say unequivocally, he is the key to everything in life. That's why over the next few months, I really, I want to go on this extended journey with you. I want to explore with you. I want you to gain a front row seat into his life as what I believe is the greatest human being to ever live. I want you to listen to what he said, to, to watch what he did, to see how he loved on other people and to learn how he, uh, oh sorry, what he said really about his heavenly father. I want you to see, as the title of our series suggests, I want you to see his servant leadership style and to really learn from his life uh, in that way. I want you ultimately to fall in love with Jesus all over again because if you don't fall in love with him, you cannot call yourself a Christian. 
Just because you attend church or just because you listen in a line doesn't mean that you're a follower of Jesus. It has to start here. And out of here flows this. And so be very careful. You say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church once every six months or so. Nah, that's not what the Bible talks about. There's a relationship that happens, and, and, and here's where I want you to just, I want to expose you to Jesus in such a way that your relationship with him is deepened, and it's lengthened, and it's strengthened. I want you to go away from this series knowing who he is, and knowing what he said, and with a, without a shadow of a doubt, being able to say, that is Jesus. We hear all kinds of stuff about what Jesus thinks, or believes, or preaches, or teaches, but what does the Bible have to say about it? That's what's most important. That's why we're going to do this extended journey. I want you to set aside some preconceived ideas about him. I want you to listen with an open ear to what one of his followers wrote about him. You know, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are really full of history, and they are full of his story. Combine the Gospels, give us an insight into Jesus' life, and they allow us to see a picture of who he was and what he did. And this extended journey, I hope for you, is going to really reveal to you the life of Jesus through the writing of Mark, who was one of his followers. Mark, of course, wrote this gospel before uh, the other ones were written, and he really actually wrote it from the perspective of one of Jesus' disciples, who was Peter. But it's Mark's words, as he writes about what Peter experienced. It's a really fast-paced gospel, so I hope you're ready to enjoy it. But this series is really going to give us a better appreciation for and an understanding of what Jesus has done for us. It will show us his humanity, and it certainly is going to reveal to us why he came to the earth and why he did what he did. So we're not going to get far today. I told you it's a fast-paced gospel. You'll find that out as we get going on it. He's going from you know, adventure to adventure to adventure uh, in, in the book of Mark. But today we're just going to deal with one verse. It's really easy to find. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Here's what it says. This is the good news, and of course we just learned from our last series that the good news, another word for the good news is what? Hopefully you remember. The gospel, that's right. This is the good news, he says, about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Again, this is as far as we're going to get today, but there's some truths in this verse that I want you to capture. Uh, our time is tight, so let me, let me jump right into it. Number one, Mark says that this book is the good news about Jesus. You ever been to a funeral? Um, where, you know, they're saying stuff about the deceased, and you're thinking, man, that's not true, right? You know what I mean, right? And, and, and you're hearing all this stuff, and, and you're looking around, and you're, you're wondering if everybody, anybody else is feeling what you're feeling, and all you're seeing is, mm -hmm, oh yeah, that's right, mm -hmm, bless God, oh, he was such a good person, she was such a saint, uh-huh. And you're thinking, are you guys nuts? Like, uh, uh, do we know the same person? Because they weren't that good of a person. I mean, they were rotten when they lived and somehow magically transformed into an angel when they died. It's not the way life works. But we do tend to do that with people when they die, don't we? We tend to immortalize. We tend to make them better than they actually are. And it would be tempting to think that that's what Mark is doing here. And in fact, what he's doing is he's writing uh, words that are breathed by the Holy Spirit of God. And they are 100% factually and actually true. This is, Mark says, the good news. All the things that you're going to read about Jesus, they're actually true. It's not like a funeral. Everybody lies about him. No, this is the good news about Jesus. And it's good news because of Jesus. It's good news because because of Jesus, we are brought back from a life of sin. It's good news because we are forgiven from our sins. It's good news because we are unconditionally loved. It's good news because we've been set apart for a purpose on this earth. And it's good news because we've been promised a home in heaven, friends. The gospel of Jesus is the good news of Jesus. And we might look at all the things that he said and done and taught over the years and think, ah, I don't know or not. No, get it into your mind and your heart. It is good news for you and I and for all of humanity. Who doesn't want their sins forgiven? Who doesn't want to know that they're loved? Who doesn't want the guarantee of eternal life? We all do. But as we're going to learn throughout this book, it's really only available through a personal relationship with Jesus and us surrendering our lives to him. You're not guaranteed a spot in heaven because you've come to church twice. I already said that. You're guaranteed a spot in heaven because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. 
and your acceptance of that for your life. Friends, the good news of Jesus is the good news for all of humanity. Just as the angel declared when Jesus, uh, when the angel announced Jesus' birth, the angel said to the shepherds, don't be afraid, for I bring you good news, which will bring great joy to all people. Christ, friends, is good news for everyone, regardless of their race, their financial status, their sex, or their ability. So it's the good news of Jesus, Mark says. Who is this Jesus, of course? He must be more than a swear word. I mean, imagine, you know, taking a hammer like this and going to put in a nail and going, Gandhi. We wouldn't do that, would we? Oh, Muhammad, I just hit my thumb. Ah. What do we do? We use the name of Jesus Christ in vain. You ever wonder the spiritual battle just in regards to that? It's one of the Ten Commandments and not taken in vain, and yet it's the only word that people use. They swear using the name of my Lord. Whole generations of people only know Jesus as a curse word, but they don't understand who he really is. You know, this verse will continue to tell us who he is. We're going to look into it a little bit further. But for a moment, listen to the words of Dr. James Allen. He posted these words, sorry, he penned these words in 1926. It's a little, uh, not really a poem, but a prose, if you will, called One Solitary Life. Listen to this. He was born in an obscure village, a child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He never wrote a book. He never held office. He never went to college. He never visited the big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from his home, from the place where he was born. He did none of these things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 30, excuse me, 33. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies, and he went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to the cross between two thieves. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing. The only property he had on earth when he was dead, he was laid, excuse me, I said that wrong. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property that he had on earth. When he was dead, he he was laid in a borrowed tomb. Through the pity of a friend, 19 centuries have come and gone, and today Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All of the armies that have ever marched and all of the navies that have ever sailed and all of the parliaments that have ever sat, all of the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. Friends, can I suggest very clearly to you today a couple of things. Number one, Jesus is the most influential person this world has ever known. Nobody has ever changed the course of humanity or influenced people's lives like Jesus has. Jesus is also the most controversial person this world has ever known. Why? Because his message wasn't received by everybody. It was for everybody, but it wasn't received by everybody. Number three, he was and is the central theme to the Bible and thus to Christianity. If any person tries to tell you otherwise, consider them a liar. This is the Jesus that we are going to be studying. This verse goes on to say, number two, that Jesus is the Messiah. Of course, in Hebrew, it was Messiah. In the Greek, it was Christ. And they both mean the anointed one. The anointed one. We don't have this practice nowadays, at least in the same way, but in in biblical times, it refers to the ancient practice of anointing a person's head with oil, literally taking a, a bottle of oil and pouring it over their head, and it would signify that they would become the next prophet or priest or king. Ancient Hebrews, of course, were looking for the Messiah. The scriptures talked about him uh, lots. He was supposed to be a deliverer who would save his people. You can read about that in Acts 42, verse 1, Acts 61, verses 1 to 3, Psalm 16, Psalm 22, and, and Daniel 9, of course, and a lot of others. They're all speaking to the Messiah that the Hebrews were waiting for. And what we need to understand is that every, every Jew knew the Old Testament thoroughly. They were trained in this kind of stuff. The Messiah is going to be coming to save us. Later, when Jesus showed up on the earth, the Jews at that time wrongly assumed that the Messiah would save them from Roman oppression. 
So when Jesus said that he was the Messiah, they rejected him. He had a different agenda than they thought he was going to have. They wrongly assumed that he was going to save them from that Roman oppression. Instead of being that military leader to save them from that Roman oppression, he was actually a spiritual leader saving them from their sins, which it turns out is much more fatal of a disease and a predicament and a condition that we have than simply being oppressed by the Roman army. They needed Jesus more than they knew, and humanity still needs Jesus more than we recognize. And the lesson learned from this idea that, you know, again, Mark says that this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. The lesson learned here, friends, is that Jesus doesn't always show up in our lives in ways that we can expect. Sometimes he shows up in ways that we don't expect. The Jews weren't looking for him to be what he was. He was the Messiah the Old Testament talked about, but they rejected him because he didn't fit their narrative. And we need to be careful of that in our own lives when when, when God teaches us something through the Scripture or through prayer, through a tug in our heart or through somebody else that doesn't fit our narrative. What are we going to do? Are we going to believe it or are we going to reject it? More often than not, we tend to reject it because it doesn't fit our narrative. And what we need to understand is that Jesus doesn't always play by our rules. He plays by the truth, friends. Keep that in mind for you and for your life. He is the longing of all of our hearts. He is the satisfier of all of our souls. He is the hunger that each of us have for something more in life. And what do we do instead? We look to alcohol. We look to illicit relationships. We look to money. We look to status. Trying to find that something in our lives that is going to fill the void. And it's only Jesus, friends. You cannot find that satisfaction in anything else. Why do you think what's-his-face says, I can't get no satisfaction. What's his name again? Huh? Mick Jagger. I can't dance like Jagger either. I don't have the moves. But guess what? He's wondering where satisfaction is coming in life. Friends, it only comes from Jesus. Paul, the Apostle Paul, had achieved the pinnacle of success in his life before coming to Jesus Christ. And then when he came to Jesus, he understood that it was all worthless if he didn't have Christ. He said in Philippians 3 verse 8, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, he says, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Jesus Christ. The question I have for you is this, do you do the same? Do I do the same? Is everything else peripheral in our lives? Does it take a back seat to the amazing, incredible knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ and having him know me? You go back to Jeremiah. I did it for one of my devotions a little while ago. Forget about money. Forget about power. Forget about status. Glory in the fact that you know Jesus and that he knows you. That's what's important in this life, friends. You need to ask yourself the question, what's it going to take for you to get to that place where you recognize Jesus as king of your life, as the anointed one in your life. He is the Messiah that we've been looking for, that the Jews have been looking for, and that we need in our lives. Number three, Mark says, not only is this the good news about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, but then he also says, Jesus, the Son of God. A little bit of theology here for you today. I promise to take it easy on you. Our time is running, but I I want you to capture this. Jesus was 100% fully God. But Jesus was also 100% fully man. The theological term for that is the hypostatic union. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says this, In Christ, all of the fullness of God dwells in a human body. You go over to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. It says that Jesus was God. And in becoming man, he didn't stop being God. He just stopped acting like God. It says that he chose to set aside his divine privileges and humble himself in the form of a human. Author Dan Spade puts it this way, Never less than God, he chose to live his life never more than man. I think that's great. I love the way he puts that. And and what we need to be very careful of is that we don't reduce Jesus. We don't say, oh, he was just a good man. He was just a good prophet. No, Mark reminds us he was the son of God. But you can't just take one scripture and run with it. It has to be backed up by other scripture. And so when you go over to Philippians and you go over to Colossians, you realize that he was still God, never stopped being the Son of God, but he was also fully 100% 
man. He chose, as Philippians reminds us again, to lay aside those divine privileges. He confined himself. He subjected himself to the limitations of a human body. Imagine the God of the universe who spoke the worlds into existence, decided through his son that he was going to limit himself to the confines of his creation. I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing for us. This means that Jesus got hungry and he got thirsty, that he was tired and he experienced pain, both physically, certainly, and mentally and emotionally. This means that he, he felt empathy and anger and frustration and peace. But it also means that the miracles that he did because he chose to limit himself, he didn't do because he was God. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I suspect some of us have thought that over the years. Well, Jesus did those because he was God. That's how he made them happen. You know, Dan, uh, Dan Spader also says Jesus never took advantage of his divinity to live out his humanity. And that's the key here. That Jesus didn't do those miracles because he was God. His miracles came from his surrender to God's will for his life. And he understood God's will as he spent time in prayer. He, he chose not to sin every day. And so sin wasn't a cloud for him. He could hear the voice of the Father. Jesus himself said in John 14, verse 12, that we would also do the same miracles that he did, but he doesn't stop there. He says, and greater ones. <laughs> you know, as a human being, friends, Jesus surrendered to the same God that we surrender to. Supernatural power in our lives doesn't come because of us. Can I just say that very clearly? Instead, it comes through us because of God. The same power that was in Jesus Christ is available to you and to I. You say, well, I haven't seen it in my life. Try getting rid of some of the sin in your life and you'll start to see God move powerfully. Can I just say that? Did I, did I say that? I said that. Try getting rid of some of the sin in your life. Try snuggling up in the lap of the Father for a moment. Try hearing His voice and understanding His heart. And you will see more of the supernatural in your life and the life of others. i gotta, I got to admit to you, that has become my goal more and more the older I get. I just want God to move so powerfully in my life and in your life. We are, in case you haven't noticed, in the last days, hello, people more than ever before need to know the real God that we serve. If you truly believe it, live it out. Get a disgust and a distaste for sin in your life, and you will see God move in powerful ways. Friends, Jesus was the Son of God. He was the one that John 3.16 talked about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And when we can fully appreciate these things, it makes the reality of him humbling himself to become like us all the more amazing. And then to know that he did it because he loved us should blow your mind away. It should make you fall deeper in love with him because of his selfless act of love towards you. And you know exactly who you are. I know who I am. And it blows my mind away that God would actually love me. Who am I? I, more than anybody else in this room, know exactly who I am. I know the struggles that I face, the temptations that I have, the doubts that I have, the things that I, I don't do that I should do. I get me. And to know that God still loves me, So why should all of this matter to you as we close this morning? It should matter because Mark's going to show us that Jesus is more than just a swear word, that he's more than just a good man or a prophet, that he's more than just some irrelevant dead guy. As the Son of God who chose not to act like God, Jesus came to free us from our sins and to show us, here it is, John 10.10, 10, how to live life to the fullest. What did he say? I have come that they might have life and not just living, breathing, sleeping, eating, dying life, but life abundantly. Life abundantly, he says. This should matter to us because what we believe about Jesus is literally a life or death decision. It should matter because we all need a moral compass if we're going to survive as a human race. And Jesus provides that compass. Why does all this matter? It should matter because Jesus offers grace and mercy to the sinner. He offers unconditional love 
to the lonely and to the hurting. He offers peace to the anxious, restoration to the broken, hope to the hopeless, forgiveness to the guilty, direction to the wanderer, and directs access to God for every person who accepts them into their life. There is in each of us, friends, a God-shaped hole that cannot be filled by anything else but God. You need Him in your life. And Jesus said, the only way to the Father is through me. So you want to know the heartbeat of the Father? Accept Jesus Christ into your life. Friends, there are only advantages to serving Jesus. Any perceived disadvantages turn out to be life-stealing pitfalls that should be avoided anyway, so who cares about them? But for some reason, we believe the lie that Jesus is a killjoy, that he takes all of our fun away, that he, that he, that he tries to just you know, squish us down into this little mold. Mm -mm. Instead, exactly the opposite. He tries to liberate us, to live how we were meant to be lived. And your life will be an example for what other people see who Jesus is. And if your life is lived as a squished down, tight as a wire, you know, I mean, I, everything is just, uh, then they're not going to be interested in your Jesus. But if your life is lived uh, in liberty and, and, and in joy and knowing that you're loved and in confidence that you have an eternity in heaven, people are going to want what you have. Friends, Jesus brings life and peace and acceptance and value. And my question to you today, listening in online or here in service, is this. Would you consider him for your life? Maybe you're here today and, uh, you know, somebody invited you. Maybe you're here today and you just kind of show it up. Maybe you're, you're here today because there's been a longing in your life for something more. And COVID has messed with you. And racial tensions have messed with you. And anxiety over sending your kids back to school has messed with you. And whatever. You're saying, I just need, I need something more for my life. Can I tell you today that Mark reminds us Jesus is that someone. It's not a something, it's a someone. And you need him in your life. Would you bow your heads with me just as we pray? Hallelujah. I want you to consider the question that I asked, that I asked you earlier. Would you consider Jesus for your life today? Father, as we just close this service and our time together, I'm so grateful that you are, again, a living God, that you hear and know and understand all that goes on in our lives. I'm so grateful that you sent Jesus to be that sacrifice on our behalf, to take our place. Greater love, Jesus said, is no man than this, and he laid down his life for a friend. Jesus knew what he was going to do, and the epitome of loving someone else is dying for them. And Jesus said, I'm going to die for those people that don't even know me, don't even love me, don't even care about me. I'm still going to die for them. Why? Because I love them with an unconditional love. Father, for those that are in here today, some understand that love, but there are some that do not. Those that are listening and online, some of them understand it, some of them do not. And as we consider the question, will you accept Jesus into your life? Father, I pray that right now by your Holy Spirit, you just begin to stir hearts and lives. There's nothing that I can do, nothing the music can do, nothing the moment can do. This is all because of the Holy Spirit drawing them. So as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, super simple question today. Would you like to ask Jesus to come into your life? To give you a new moral compass? To show you how to live life to the fullest, to give you an understanding that he is more than just a swear word, that he's more than just an irrelevant dead guy. You know, the scripture tells us that after he was put to the cross and died, that he was risen again on the third day. And then scripture reminds us that he's now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and I. That means when Satan comes knocking on God's door and says, hey, you know, you know that guy down there? You should see what they did. They're a, you're a huge sinner. Jesus goes, uh-uh. They've asked me into their life, and my blood covers their sins. I took the guilt of their sins. Friends, without Jesus, you pay the penalty for your own sins. With Jesus, that penalty's been paid. So super simple question. Would you like to know more? Would you like to ask Jesus Christ into your life. I'm even speaking to those of you that are listening in online. Just because you're not here doesn't mean you, can't, you can avoid the question. You have to hear this today. 
you need Jesus in your life. If you'd like to ask him into your life, I would love to be able to pray with you and teach you more. That's our job as a church, to teach you more. But what I need you to do is make that decision. And I can't make that for you. Only you can. If you're ready today, you'd say, I'd like to have him in my life. I'd like to know him more. I'd like to know that my sins are forgiven. Would you just raise a hand right where you are? I'll see you. We'll nod. I'll nod at you. We'll, we'll lock eyes for a moment. I can't preach about Jesus and not give you this opportunity, friends. I can't do it. Anybody here today say, I need Jesus in my life. Listening in online. I can't see your hand raised, but you can send me an email this week and let me know that you'd like to know more about Jesus. But anybody here today? All right. Again, decision between you and God. If you're here journeying and you're just checking more about God, thank you for being here. Please come back. Please hear more about who he is. There's no pressure for you to accept Jesus. We're just simply saying to you, this is the decision you need to make. Please do it. So, Father, for each person that's here today, I'm going to assume that they are somewhere along their journey with knowing you. And I'm grateful for that. Would you allow, allow you know, this, this, uh, this book to come alive for us, the life and times of Jesus, to really reveal to us who he is and what he has done in our lives? Would you f- help us to fall deeper in love with Jesus, to know more about him so that when other people who have different ideas about Jesus come along, we can say, ah, oh, that's not really true, and we can take them to the scripture and we can show them. Father, I pray that Jesus would come alive in our hearts and lives. And in these last days, we would never forget to preach about and speak about his great love for us, his incredible sacrifice on our behalf, and what he's done for us. We have so much to be thankful for. So Father, bless each person as they sign off online, as they leave from this building now. Be with them, keep them safe. Honor them, Lord, uh, thank you that they, they can be here. And Lord, as we continue to slowly gather back as a church family, as we even look to doing church a little bit differently, because we're looking at that. How do we do church a little differently? How do we reach the most amount of people? How do we care for our people? How do we best exhibit the original church in Acts 2? Father, I pray for wisdom and grace and favor. That your name would be made famous in this community. Help us, God, to do that. To make sure that people know Jesus still saves And he still sets free. Father, we bless you and we love you today for all you've done and are doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for bearing with us for a little bit longer today. It is a longer service than uh, normal during our our COVID time. We usually try to run a little over an hour, but thank you for being with us. I'm going to actually release you uh, from the back row first. Uh, Please, if you would help us that way, throw your mask back on. Please remember again, if you want to hang out with, uh, with your friends, do so outside. Okay, so back row, uh, you guys are welcome to go first. If you can go out the side doors, please. That would be a big help for us. We do have ushers there that are helping to open those doors, keeping everybody safe. All right, second and, uh, sorry, your third row, third last row, you guys are welcome to go. Hope you enjoyed today's service. We'd love to have you join us in person next week if you're comfortable. Don't forget to email me at Roxana at christianlifecenter.ca if you're interested in water baptism on Sunday, September 20th. And please head to www.christianlifecenter.ca to register for our drive-in outdoor service on that same day. If you can't join us in person, we will continue to live stream our services through our YouTube channel. We would love to see you, but please worship wherever you're comfortable. Until next time, CLC family, have an amazing week.